sure? Yeah. You can. You can I can't even. I can't even clap, bro. Oh, that's true. I can't even clap for that. Lord know what he's doing. He calls me preaching. I sing. Amen. Amen. Playing the instrument. Yeah, I know. I know. I get the amen on that this morning, Floyd. But now, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter twenty-six this morning, Matthew chapter twenty-six. You know, um, whenever you think about, whenever you think about what God, what God does in these verses by leaving us these verses to read, I just want you to just, you know, sometimes, sometimes, whenever you go to sit down in a place and you go to hear a sermon, you know, you're thinking about all the things you might be thinking about, all the different things in your life, or you might be thinking about what's going on in the bar, or you might be thinking about what you might have done in the past. I just want you to just take just a moment today. Just clear your mind, Lord willing. And just take your mind back to where Jesus was. And this that went on right here. Because this is powerful. This is very powerful. Just Not just the words that are said this morning in the Bible, in the scripture we're going to read. But just that image. That image of what transpires here in chapter 26. It's just beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things you'll see in scripture. So let's stand together in honor of reverence for reading God's word. I'm going to read down to you. Verse 15, 16, right around there. It says, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is, to be, is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people into the place of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtility and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman. This is part I'm talking about. This is part I'm talking about. It's just beautiful. This woman who's been forgiven of her sins, her many sins, who loved Jesus so deeply. She just wanted to honor him. That's why she come. She just come to honor him. Just take a moment in time and honor him. He had done so much for her. Literally, this, this box, this ointment, this thing, this oil she poured out upon Jesus. Like this thing cost a year's worth of wages. So if you, you know, you make sixty or hundred thousand dollars, that's what it, it took. She poured it out upon him. And it's just beautiful. It's just a beautiful, beautiful sight. And there came up him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation say, for what purpose is his waste? There's a lot of people in the world don't understand today. They don't understand why we're doing what we're doing today. They don't understand why you're living for God, why you changed your life, why you, you know, have taken and given everything to Him. Why you pay such a high price just to honor Him. But look at what it says. They seen it was as a waste. For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble you the woman? For she hath brought a good work upon me. For ye had the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say to you, wheresoever the gospel shall be preached in this whole world, there shall also be this that this woman had done, be told for memorial of her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said to them, What will you give me? I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And for that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Lord, I pray you bless the reading and the preaching of your word. I pray, Lord, you'd move in our hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, supernaturally through the power of the Holy Spirit, you do what I asked him to do this morning. You clear our minds and our hearts. Put that image in our mind of that wonderful woman pouring this beautiful oil over your head, prepare you for burial. And Lord, just help us feel the gravity of Calvary this morning. And Lord, the power of the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may see you. So I want to talk about a couple of things. I want to talk about a couple of things this morning. So like Paul said, what he used to count as gain, he now counted as loss. That's one of the staples of his way that he taught in the New Testament. All the things that he had in his life, he counted them as loss. He counted them as dumb. He counted them as nothing. He had several ways he said that, but he was just letting them know that this new life that he's living for Christ meant everything. And his old way of life in the world meant nothing to him. Like nothing. Literally nothing to him. It didn't even register in his mind anymore. He had full tilt given his life to Christ. 
And so we see a picture of that. And what this woman does, she comes and she takes us out of Baxter Bob. And she pours this precious ointment on Jesus' head. And so first thing we see is what they were taught. So the disciples are hearing. Jesus literally was teaching them all the time. And there's so much we can learn from this right here. What happened with Jesus and this woman. This, this exchange between them. This moment that they had. That Jesus said literally would be known about throughout all eternity. That everywhere the gospel is preached. That this will be talked about. This woman will be talked about. And her sacrifice will be talked about. And one of the things that they mentioned was, you know, the, the disciples, they looked at the monetary value of that. They looked at how much that cost. And they looked at how many more things could have been done here on this earth with that money. If they just poured it out upon Jesus. And But one of the things that Jesus was teaching on there that you can miss, if you don't watch it is, that listen, nothing on earth, nothing on earth, there's literally nothing. They mentioned the poor. And I mean, literally, we see where Jesus healed blind beggars. They encountered beggars everywhere they went. You know, they would see sometimes people with leprosy that had sores. And we see people in all kind of, you know, different ways in the world. And here in America, we're blessed. We don't see it like it is in other countries. But literally, little kids starving. I mean, people all over the world. And so, you know, they mentioned this and they looked at this and they seen all this money that could have been made from this ointment. And she poured it out on Jesus' head. But what Jesus was teaching them was that him being, his, his, prep, his preparation for burial was more important than earthly things. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. He was getting prepared to die. Now you don't know when you're going to die. But Jesus knew. He was prepared. He said, I've done this. She's done this in preparation for my burial. There's nothing more important than to be ready for death. There's nothing on this earth that matters more than taking the gospel to lost people. There's nothing more important this morning than you coming and being saved if you're lost. You giving your life to Christ. There's nothing. There's nothing. That's worth holding on to. There's nothing that's worth keeping you from coming and fully committing your life to Christ. There's nothing worth keeping you from coming and fully submitting to Christ. You see, the thing that, that Jesus taught him, the thing this lady taught him was, listen, that you need to be prepared. And that eternity is more important than time. Eternity is more important than time. It outweighs it. Time is nothing compared to eternity. That's another way to say what Paul was saying. That my eternity, what I will have in eternity, where I will be in eternity, what I will be in eternity, matters more than what I have here. Like this is nothing. Like the book of James said, it's literally like a vapor. Literally like a vapor. Like, you know, in a cold day, you, that, that breath comes out your mouth and you can see it, then it's gone. Literally, that's what your life is like. Nothing is more important than eternity. So you look at this and you see that Jesus was prepared to die. Jesus was prepared to sacrifice himself. Jesus was prepared to, to pay for your sins. Jesus was ready. Are you ready? Are you ready this morning? Do you know that you're ready? Do you feel confident that you're ready? Do you know where you'll be? And let me ask you, I ask people, do you know where you'll be? Yeah, going to heaven. Why do you know that? How do you know that? What is it based upon? See, when you look at, when you look at where I'm fixing to go with this, you're going to see regrets that remain. I've got a lot of regrets. But I'm going to tell you, one day Jesus is going to wipe away all my tears. Amen? One day all my heartache and all my pain will be gone. Amen? One day my life will be filled with nothing but joy and happiness. Amen? I'm telling you right now, that day is coming for me. You know, the regrets won't remain. But there's some people that have regrets that will remain for eternity. There's some people that have regrets that will remain and can never be taken away. Some people have regrets that they'll feel forever. You know why? Because they were not ready to die. 
They did not get prepared to die. Like the disciples. The disciples didn't believe Jesus was going to die. They thought he was going to be a political leader and come and free him from the Romans. They thought they had it all figured out. They couldn't believe that God, God in the flesh was going to die. They just couldn't accept it. They didn't want to deal with it. But it came. You know why it came? Because God said it was coming. Jesus said in three days, in three days, I'll be crucified. Listen to me. In three days he rose again after he was crucified. You know why he did that? Because he said he's going to do it. You know what else he said? In Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die and then to judgment. Every single person in here is going to die. If the, unless the Lord comes to rapture the church, every person in here is going to die. And you don't want to deal with it. You're like the disciples. You don't want to think about it. They couldn't imagine life without Jesus physically being with them. They didn't want to think. They knew what their life was like before. You can't imagine what hell would be like. You don't want to think about hell. You don't want to think about judgment. You don't want to think about how you live your life. And how the Bible says you should. Because you're going to be standing before God and wants to die and into judgment. You know, one day you'll stand before God for how you live. We don't want to think about those things. We're just like those disciples. But that day is coming. And the best thing you can do is be prepared. Amen? Be packed up. Be ready. Right now. Right now. Jesus knew when he was going to die. You don't know. But that ain't the end of the story. Look at what he goes on to say. That was what they were taught. But look at what she brought. Look at what was brought. She brought, listen, she brought everything. She brought everything. A year's worth of wages. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the extreme extravagance of that moment that she took a year's worth of wages and went and just poured it on his head? Can you imagine that? I know, like we read in the Bible, like, yeah, that's the way it should have been. And it ain't your $60,000. I don't what if I said, Jeffrey, next week, I want you to take your year's worth of wages and give it to me so I can go buy some oil. <coughs> and you should have poured on someone's head. What do you think you're going to say? To me? And if you wouldn't do it and someone else went and did it, you'd think that's crazy. You'd be like, man, that must, that must be a special person. That must be a special moment. And it was. Think about the extravagance of it. She brought everything to him. Think about how we do. Think about how we do. Literally, think about how we do. We bring just enough to get by. Come on now. Most people bring just enough to get by. Just enough to get by. Just enough to get by. Because you don't understand. Literally, you don't understand. That was nothing to her. She was living in sin. She had no way out. You didn't know her misery. You didn't know her pain. You didn't know how depressed. You didn't know how empty she was. You didn't know how tormented she was. But then all of a sudden, this man came. And so many men had told her before, so many people had told her before they could help her, they could take care of her. They would make her happy, they would bring her joy. The world just promised you this and it promised you that. Can you imagine how many times you've been let down? Can you think about how many times you've been lied to? Can you tell me how many times you've been tricked? How many times you thought you had the thing you were looking for? That it was the thing, it was it, it was what you were missing, but then it just disappointed you like everybody else and everything else. But this man came and this man was different. This man was God. This man was everything he said he was and more. He brought more to her in that moment when he gave her himself than anybody and anything had ever could give her the whole world. Like literally, literally, you think about this. You think about this. She poured out a year's worth of man's wages. God took and poured out the blood of his son. He bankrupted heaven. He bankrupted heaven for you and for me. I mean, what we give him in comparison, we give our life is nothing. I mean, it's literally nothing compared to what God did for us. 
What we sacrifice is nothing compared to what God sacrificed for us. What we do for God is nothing compared to what God paid for us. Hey, listen, he not only bought me, but he sought me. I was not looking for God. I wasn't hunting God down. God coming to found me. He piled her up. He cleaned her up. And he lifted her up. Just like any, every blood bought born again believer in this place this morning. Amen. We owe him everything. No matter what it is he's calling you to give up and come and follow him this morning. It's not worth nothing in your hands. It's going to, it's going to lead to nothing. It's not worth anything. He's worth more than anything you've got or could ever have. He's worth more than all the world put together. He's Jesus. He's a God man. He's a Savior. But the whole world, that's what she brought. You see what she was taught. You see what they were taught. That eternity matters more than time. That you need to be ready for death. And you see what was brought. She brought her best. Are you bringing him your best today? Has he got your best today? Or do you stand, you stand on the sidelines and wonder why the people that do it do it? We saw what was taught. We see what was brought. And we see who it was that was bought. Judas left there and he went to negotiate. Check this out. I don't know if you ever thought about this scripture this way, but check this out. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him 30 pieces of silver. He said, What will you give me? We look at that. You know before before Judas did this, that Judas was a very real popular name. There was a, uh, one of the Maccabees named Judas that was a famous brave man in Jewish history had taken and stood up and was revered in Jewish history and people loved to name their son Judas. It was really a popular name, Brother Richard. But you know what? It wasn't after this. Nobody names their son Judas anymore. You know why that is? Because of this. And we look at what Judas did and we say, how could Judas betray Jesus? Like Jesus went and found him. Jesus called him to follow him. Jesus loved him. I mean, to the last moment, Jesus loved Judas. When Judas was betraying Jesus, Judas, Jesus loved Judas. He did nothing but love Judas. He did nothing but die for the sins of Judas. He did nothing but call Judas to come and follow him. But it wasn't enough for Judas. Look what Judas did. He went and made a deal, right? 30 pieces of silver. It's like what a used car would kind of cost nowadays. He sold himself for the price of a slave. Think about that. Who was bought? Judas was bought. He said, what will you give me? He was making a deal. He was making a deal. We know what Judas was bought with. We know what Judas was bought for. If you're in here today and you ain't serving God, what did you cost? What did you cost? You may look down on Judas today. Read these verses and think about how Jesus was crucified. I want to tell you something. Your sins and my sins is what put him on that cross. We're just as responsible as Judas was for putting him on that cross. We're just as responsible as Judas was for the last on his back. And there's some people here, you know, the disciples were looking around when Jesus said, There's one in here that'll betray me. And he's saying, You know, they were saying, Who is it? You know what? They didn't even think it was Judas. I mean, he was the guy they trusted the most. He's the guy with the money, right? You ain't going to give all the money you have in your life to the dude you don't trust. 
Like I said, he had a brave name. He had the right look. He acted the right way. But in his heart, in his heart, he was looking for what he could get out of it. He wasn't looking to come and serve God. He wasn't looking to give to God. He was looking to see what he could get. And when he didn't get enough of what he wanted from Jesus, he wouldn't make a deal with the world. He wouldn't make a deal with the devil. You see, the devil was heavily involved when it says Satan himself entered into Judas' heart. How much did you cost? You say, well, I don't know how to figure that out. I can tell you how you can figure out really quick. What is keeping you from serving God? What is keeping you from coming and being saved? That's what the devil bought you with. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. For some people, it's a dollar. Just like Judas. For some people, it's a dollar. Just like Judas. Hey, for some people, it's a trophy. For some people, it's popularity. For some people, it's comfort and ease. But if you aren't serving him and you aren't saved, see, there's some saved people who sold out to you. Yeah. You used to be faithful. You used to serve him. And if I was to ask you, and, you know, by your testimony, you say you're saved. Well, then what did he buy you with? Who's been bought? You see what was taught? That eternity is more important than time. You see what was brought when you're really right with God? You're going to bring everything. It ain't going to matter what he asked for. But I also see who was bought. The one that was self-serving. And didn't want to sacrifice. Didn't want to give up this life. You think about it. Judas wasn't the only one. There was a rich young ruler. He came to Jesus. And he said, what can I do that I can have eternal life? And he had a lot of money. He was rich. And Jesus, see what Jesus did. It wasn't about his money. It wasn't about his money. People get tripped up about what happened to rich young ruler. But it was not about his money. Why Jesus asked him to give his money to the poor wasn't to buy salvation. is because Jesus knew that was the thing he treasured the most. Jesus knew that money, that rich man, that rich young ruler's money was his idol. He knew that if he, he was willing to give that up and come, that he'd give up everything. Jesus knew the rich young ruler's heart. But the Bible says that the rich young ruler, he walked away greedy because he had great possessions. He didn't want to give up his idols. Then you see someone like Ananias and Sapphira. See, Judas wasn't the only one. Ananias and Sapphira, you can read in the New Testament in Acts. People were coming and giving all they had to the church. I mean, because them people back then were in a bad place and they were trying to help everybody just survive and live. When you come to Christianity, you left the Jewish world like they would turn their back on you. So these people were trying to take care of one another. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they, they were a little more scheming than Judas. They were a little more scheming than Judas. They were actually going to give something. They said, you know what? We're going to tell everybody we gave everything to Jesus. But they only gave half. And they kept the other half. And then she went shopping. Yeah. Like her Amazon Prime would have been full. Her car was loaded down. They come to lay it down. They come to lay this, the, the, what, the other half down and try to fool everybody were scheming in the church. You know, there were them people that everybody in town talks about that don't want to come sit with in church. Hypocrites, right? Because they put on a face of one thing, but they were doing another. Amen. Amen. And so they came in. She had on, probably had on stiletto heels. I'm just kidding. Bro. I don't know what she had on. Y'all ladies be rocking them heels on Easter. I don't see how y'all walking them things. I'm like, dude, man. Golly, if I could pull some of that off, it would be awesome, Floyd. We'd actually be taller. We might get in six foot. Good Lord, you know. Some of y'all look like y'all been sheetrocking them stills for so high. But anyway, so they walk in all decked out. And you know what happens? The apostles look at them and they say, you know what? You're going to die because you lied to the Holy Ghost. 
and it dropped dead. Had a nice drop dead. So fire come in behind him. They had their scheme all worked out, and she dropped dead. Regrets that remain. Judas is in hell. Regret every day of his life. Because when you die, you're going to live somewhere. Amen. Ananias and Sapphira dead. Graveyard dead. The rich young ruler. Unless he changed where he was living and how he was living, he's burning in hell right now. Regrets that remain. You see who was bought. Listen to this. Listen to what, listen to what Judas did. I want you to hear what Judas did. I want you to listen at Judas's regret. Turn over to, flip over one page, verse, uh, chapter 27, verse 1. Look at this when the morning comes. When the morning comes. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented. Repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned. I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And he went. Look what he did. Look what he did. You talking about regrets that remain. He hung himself. He hung himself. Now he got everything he asked for. When he went to the chief priest, he got every dime he asked for. He got everything he wanted. But he hung himself. Look at his regrets, man. You talking about regrets? And he cast down the piece of the silver in the temple, and the part went and hanged himself. He tried to give it back. But if you look up that word repent, he repented himself. It's not a bit, that's not a word we think of as repentance, like turning away from sin and turning to God. It just means he regretted it. See, he didn't go as far as what Jesus said. If you look in when Jesus was preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You remember that? Remember John the Baptist preaching that? Jesus preaching that? That word repent is a different word. It's a different Greek word. It means to turn away from your sin and to turn to God. It means to turn around. It means to change your direction. This word here that Judas used when he repented, he just had regrets. He just said he regretted it. He tried to make up on his own. He didn't come to God and ask God to forgive him and repent in biblical terms. He just regretted it. He was just sorry for what he done. I'm telling you people today, some of you may have been sorry for what you've done when you sinned. But you never repented. When you repent, your life changes. When you repent, you turn from serving the world and serving yourself and you turn to serving God. That's what true repentance does. It not only changes your outlook, it changes your direction. And it takes real repentance. And Judas regretted for eternity the sins he made because he never repented. He never truly repented. So I ask you today, I ask you today a couple of questions. Just a couple of questions. When Judas came looking for Jesus, what was he wanting? Think about it in that garden. He walked up to Jesus and he kissed him. I don't know about you, but I don't let everybody kiss on me. Think about how many people you say, man, that was awful. Judas just came and kissed Jesus on the cheek and went right out there and betrayed him and turned his back on him. You think about how many people come to church on Sunday morning on Easter and they kiss him on the cheek and they walk right out and go live like the world. It ain't no different. It ain't no different. Judas said, what will you give me? And they bought him. 
If you ain't living for God, what did you cause? I hope you weren't cheap. Because it's going to cost you for eternity. Unless you truly not just have regrets like Judas did, but truly repent and turn from your sins and turn to God this morning. And that's what we're going to give you a chance to do. That's what we're going to give you an opportunity to do. Don't be like the rich young ruler and let the stuff you have that you don't want to let go keep you from coming to Christ. Don't be like Ananias and Sapphira. Don't come in here being fake and hypocritical. You come in here and really get your heart right today and come to serve God and really give him everything. Not half-hearted like they did. Not half of what they own, but everything. Come and give it to him. And please don't be like Judas. Don't be like Judas. Don't just come in here this morning and kiss him on the cheek and tell him you love him and go live like the world. Not one more year. Let this year be different. Let this moment be different. Because what Jesus taught us is so important. We must be prepared for death. And eternity is more important than time. Eternity is more important than time. Lord, as, as you move in this place, and I could just feel you moving in this place. I could feel you moving from the time they started singing this morning. Lord, you've been with us at sunrise this morning. And God, all these beautiful, wonderful people are coming here this morning. And I just pray, God, if you've got a hold of somebody's heart this morning, that they come. They wouldn't worry about knowing everything they need to know or all the stuff they're going to have to do later. They just do what we asked earlier today. They just clear their mind of tomorrow and yesterday. And just concentrate on listening to your voice this morning as you call them to come. I pray for the ones that have fell away from you, Lord. I know they love you. And many of them saved. But they just fell away from you. I pray they come back and recommit their life to you this morning. Just come and recommit and give everything back to you this morning. Lord, you forgave Peter. Peter left and walked out and denied you. But God, you forgave him and you loved him. And you put him back to work. And that's what I pray you do with many people this morning. You put them back in right fellowship with you and you put them back to work. And God, for all those that are serving you with everything they got. All those that come and have laid it down at your feet. All those that are here this morning, God. And they just like that little lady with the out of basket box. They just bring everything to pour it out on you this morning. God bless them. Fill their hearts with joy. God, show them favor and blessing in their life. Love on them, Lord. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to stand.